In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Today is a day of great joy. Today Christ saves another soul. Today his kingdom on earth gains ground. Today the body of Christ has a new member, or will have a new member. Today Christ prepares a new place in heaven for his elect, a proper inheritance for his new daughter. But not all would agree that we ought to be rejoicing. There have been heretics who have in the past scorned the generation of children as evil, as the enslavement of souls in evil bodies. And we know that sounds really odd to us, but today we find many many who openly question whether or not one should bring children into this world at all, who sneer at large families as irresponsible and so on. Now, We disagree with them, but they might respond. They might defend their negativity and say, doesn't the church teach that all are born slaves of sin and the devil? That because of the sins of our first parents, all are born not to life, but to a living death, born in sin and destined for corruption. And this is true. Our first parents, Adam and Eve, did in fact doom all their offspring by their sin. They were given a word, a world filled with life. And because of their disobedience and desire, they brought death into this world. Should we not lament this death? Should we not sorrow? Are not all children born into sin, into the estrangement from God, caused not by themselves, but by their first parents? Is this not an occasion for shame rather than joy? Through his cross and resurrection, our Lord Jesus Christ has not only conquered sin and death, but transformed the dead into the living. He has brought life out of death, has found what was lost and restored it to an even higher place than it had been before. He does not give up on sinful man and just start over. He does not destroy sin by destroying sinners. He transforms the sinner into the saint. He brings life where there once was only death. How does he do this? Through the incarnation and through his suffering, death, and resurrection. Consider the incarnation. God chose to become man. He chose to become a descendant of his own creation chose to have sinful men and women as his ancestors, according to the flesh, chose to have his first disobedient children, Adam and Eve, as his first parents, according to the flesh. Eve, whose name means mother of the living, by her sin became more a mother of death, as the church fathers tell us. But through the immaculate conception of our blessed mother Mary and the incarnation. Eve was made mother of the living once again. God did not make new men from the dust. He transformed the descendants of Adam and Eve, transformed the one line of human generation, transformed it from death to life. How different is this from the habits of modern man? In our world, when something breaks, it's often easier just to throw it out and get something new. And we are tempted to treat each other that way too, to cast off friendship, to cut ties because of past sins, past hurts, out of anger or shame, to give up on someone and say that who you were defines who you are now and who you will always be. Again, because of fear of shame or perhaps just ease. How often are we tempted to throw the sinner out, to give up and start fresh? I wouldn't be surprised if people today were more faithful to their, to their cell phone maker than to their spouse. But not so our good God, who is faithful to us even when we are not faithful to him. He does not give up and start over with someone else. He first works to produce repentance in the sinner and conversion, to bring back the lost sheep, 
to welcome the prodigal son, to restore him to his status, to adorn him with rings and fine garments. This he does for the repentant sinner. This he does for all who are in a state of sin, including the child before baptism, all who wish to be restored. He does this for each he does for each what he did once for all men. He restored what was lost. But more than that, again, elevates it far beyond its original position. Before the fall, Adam and Eve enjoyed a paradise of natural delights. Rather than simply restore fallen man to Eden through baptism, God has made him fit for heaven and heir, not to a merely earthly kingdom, but a heavenly one. And the price of this restoration, what is the cost of such a privilege? What is the cost of the baptism we celebrate today? The sacrifice of all sacrifices, the greatest work that ever could be done, our Lord's suffering and death on the cross. But what is this in itself? But again, to bring life out of death. At the resurrection, it was the same physical body that our Lord raised up, his bruised, torn, pierced, bloody body, now made resplendent and glorified. This transforms his physical body, but even more, he brings life for all men out of the greatest sin man ever committed or could commit, attempting to to kill God, attempting to kill his own creator, St. Cyril of Jerusalem says, The injustice of sinners was not so great as the justice of him who died for us. We have not sinned to the extent that he transcends through righteousness who gave up his life for us. Christ's atonement atonement for our sin so far outshines our sin so as to eclipse it entirely. So what shall we say now? Have we answered those heretics who condemned bringing children into this world? Surely we do not rejoice in sin. Surely we do not see in original sin a happy state, nor do we see in our own actual sins anything good in themselves. Surely we cannot be thankful that Adam and Eve sinned any more than we can be thankful for our own sins. But we can be thankful for what for the life that God has brought out of sin. In this spirit, the church herself sings in the exalted from the Easter vigil, O truly necessary sin of Adam, which which the death of Christ has blotted out, O happy fault that merited such and so great a redeemer, O Felix culpa, O happy fault, Without this sin of our first parents, as Thomas teaches, the incarnation would never have happened. Now, when you think of this happy fault, we naturally think of original sin, but we might consider the crucifixion itself. Was there any sin greater than that? To murder the perfect, innocent God-man who had so fully demonstrated his divinity? To put to death the very font of life itself? All the times the Jews rebelled against God in the Old Testament, did they ever commit a sin so great as that? Would not God have been justified to kill all men in response, or just to ignore man entirely? I gave you a chance, and look what you did. That's it. We're done. No more. But God takes the greatest sin, the greatest evil that man could ever do, and transforms it into the greatest gift of life and salvation. For all who are baptized, for all who, either themselves or through their sponsor, reject sin and the devil, and let themselves be washed by Christ. Again, the merit won by Christ on the cross so far outshines the darkness of even the greatest of sins, putting Christ to death. How much does it not outshine our own sins? How much does it transform them? How much does God, who is all-knowing and all-loving, mercifully convert even these dark moments in our life to paint a beautiful picture of our redemption? 
He who orders all things rightly takes even our most disordered moments and makes them serve his most good and wonderful purposes. He creates life where there once was only death. Do we call sin good? Was the fall good? Was the crucifixion good? Are any of our own sins good? No, not in themselves. But Christ brings water out of rock. He transforms these evils so fully into good that we ought to lose sight of the original evil to turn our eyes only onto the good, the life that God has made. Think of the saints. Every trial and hardship of this life is like nothing to them now that they enjoy the bliss of heaven. And we know that the saints were not always saints, with the exception of our Blessed Mother. How many saints have committed even grave sins? And yet saved from these evils now, filled with life, are they saddened by them? No. The saints do not spend heaven sad and grieved over their sins, as much as they may have done so rightly on earth. Instead, now they see but the mercy of God, the goodness of God, how God even transformed their sins so as to eventually serve their salvation. Remember what our Lord says, He who is forgiven much loves much. So too ought we to see baptism. This child is now a slave of sin under the cruel dominion of the devil. But when Christ liberates her, frees her from her sinful, enslaved past, there will be nothing left but to rejoice in the love God has for her, the love God has for all of us. I close with the last section of the epistle for today. It's from St. Paul's letter to the Colossians. May you be completely strengthened through God's glorious power unto perfect patience and long-suffering, joyfully rendering thanks to God the Father, who has made us worthy to share the lot of the saints in light. He has rescued us from the power of darkness and has transferred us into the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have our redemption through his blood, the remission of our sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.